We are the CAT 8, also known as the Community Assistance Team 8. Is a group of Jain individuals and professionals who are assisting the community at large. During the COVID-19 crisis, CAT 8 began just before the COVID-19 crisis. When it held a can challenge, where children created iconic monuments using cans of food, raised some three tons of canned foods, enough supply for four months for the Watford Food Bank, run by the Trussell Trust. During the COVID-19 crisis, Cat Eight is helping the elderly, the vulnerable, those in isolation, and key workers. With meals, essential shopping. Help with medicine collection and someone to talk to whilst coping with isolation. Get 8 has lined up a series of webinars. In addition, we have created a helpline for individuals and businesses that need guidance on the various government schemes and the topics of the webinars. Cat 8 is working with or supporting various organizations, including Go Dharmic, Sevate, No Nut, SCVP, One Jane, The Trussell Trust, and working with many volunteers. Cat8 is the newest network fiber connecting the community. Thank you, everybody. So today we have two speakers who will be presenting. Firstly, we have Samir Shah, who is the founder and director of Capitax Financial, a firm of chartered accountants, tax and business advisors based in Stanmore. Samir is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. With over 22 years of experience, Samir divides his time between developing and managing the practice and concentrating on adding value to the firm's clients. His extensive experience and interest allow him to be passionate in advising both entrepreneurs and businesses across their personal and business tax affairs. Samir also has developed particular expertise and focus towards the taxation of non-UK domiciled individuals, including internationally mobile employees, expatriates, and entrepreneurs with UK residents and non-UK residents issues. Our second speaker is Sailesh Shah, who is a co-founding partner of Flemings. After graduating from Cambridge University in 1983, Sailesh joined KPMG in London, qualifying as a chartered accountant in 1986, and continued his post-qualification training in audit, accounting, and tax with KPMG. When he found that now he founded uh, uh, Flemings and is now a currently an audit, accounting, and tax partner at Flemings. So over to you, Samir. Thank you very much, Rumit, for the brilliant introduction. Good morning to you all, and I warmly welcome you to this webinar on inheritance tax. So here's the agenda for today's webinar. We will start off with the introduction to inheritance tax. I may refer to it time and again, saying IHT. Tax-free bans, I will cover some planning areas around gifting. I will then talk about domicile in the context of inheritance tax. I will then hand over to Salesh for the second part of the presentation and Salesh will be covering some key IHT planning solutions. We will then have a Q&A session. So 
rising IST tax take. Let's look at some statistics. As you can see from the graph, the HMRC tax revenues from inheritance tax is going up year on year. At present, HMRC collects about six billion pounds of tax, which is quite a small chunk compared to the overall tax or overall revenues it collects from all other taxes, which is in excess of 600 billion pounds. It is basically the increase in asset values over the years, which has led to increase in inheritance tax bills. And typically it's property prices, our homes. So before I move on to the next slide, I think it's worth noting that in practice, inheritance tax is paid on less than 5% of death estates. That's a small number. And there are two reasons for this. Firstly, wealthy individuals account for only 1% of the UK population. HMRC definition of a wealthy individual is someone who earns more than 150,000 pounds or has assets in excess of 1 million pounds. Do you think you fall into this category? Do you think you may fall into this category? Something to think about. Second, most wealthy individuals pay minimal tax due to steps taking, taken in planning to mitigate the liability. The wealthy individuals pay almost no inheritance tax. And this is due to affordability on sophisticated planning uh, advice taken from professionals and tax specialists. So what is inheritance tax? Inheritance tax is a tax on a state of someone who's passed away. The estate is typically cash in the bank, investments, property, business, cars, payouts from life insurance policies, less any debts, less any liabilities. It is effectively known as the UK's death tax. The IHT payable is a staggering 40% on the death estate. And please be reminded, you have already paid taxes such as VAT, income tax, national insurance, stamp duty, and perhaps even capital gains tax. Sounds horrifying, isn't it? A further IHT bill can potentially deplete family wealth and create a cash flow headache too. And where assets, are, and where assets left behind are illiquid, for example, properties, it can create big issues. The tax is normally due within six months from the end of the month in which the death occurred. So other family members in the meantime will be scrambling around, trying to organize a payment, even trying to make sense of what assets have been left behind. And it can be quite stressful. It was actually meant as a tax on the super rich. However, anyone these days, as you know, with a modest house in certain parts of the country, it is now catching up with the average family. So unfortunately, the brutal tax will affect all of us at some point, you like it or not. So what is a death estate? As I said earlier in my, in my earlier slide, that it is basically a pool of all your assets, including properties, savings, any shares you hold, less any debts or mortgages, business assets, pensions. You can even deduct funeral expenses. And when you minus all of these from the pooled assets, you get your death estate. Some of us, well, all of us will be eligible for some sort of bans, whether it's nil rate ban or residential nil rate ban. When we deduct these amounts from the death estate, we, got, we get something called a net death estate. And that is the figure which is subject to inheritance tax at 40%. So let's talk about a couple of bands. The nil rate band, what is it? A flat rate of 40% is applied to your IHD death estate valued in excess of 325,000 pounds. And this is what we call the nil rate band. So if your assets are below 325,000 pounds, there won't be any inheritance tax to pay. However, if your assets are worth above the 325,000 pounds, then you will pay tax at 40% on anything above this amount. The nil rate band can be transferred between married couples or civil partners and one, when, when one spouse dies, even that if they died many years ago. So currently we have a, a, a couple's nil rate ban, which is 650,000 pounds. I have a simple example on this slide. Um, someone dying uh, who was unmarried, uh, worth about half a million pounds, uh, will be paying, uh, rather the estate will be paying 70,000 pounds, which is 40% on the difference between half a million pounds and the nil rate band, which is 325,000 pounds. There is a further band which was introduced 
a couple of years ago. So the residence nail right band, this was designed to make it easier for you to pass on the family home to without incurring any IHT charges. Now, a lot of us will be falling into this net simply because the, of the property prices going up. And typically it's our main home, especially those living in London or around London, we all will be caught out. So you may qualify for this residence nail rate ban if you're giving away your home to your direct descendants, that could be children, grandchildren, or, or great grandchildren. And this includes stepchildren, foster children, or even adopted children. This means you could potentially gain an additional threshold before IHD becomes due, which is 175,000 pounds currently per person or 350,000 pounds per couple. Similar to the nil rate band, any unused portions of the residence nil rate band can be transferable between spouses or civil partners. However, with, like with any other tax or any other uh, planning, uh, any other relief, there are restrictions which should be considered. The first restriction, the residence nail rate band is only available on estates under two million pounds. And it's interesting to look at the definition of the estate for this purpose. You basically ignore any business asset, any, any business asset relief or business property relief, what we call it, in arriving at this estate value. So once an estate is over this amount, the relief tapers one pound for every two pounds in increase in the estate value. So in essence, this relief is lost if your estate is worth over 2.35 million or 2.75 or 2.7 million where you are eligible for the couple's nil rate band. It may sound like a big figure, but as time goes, depending on what stage you are in your life, it won't be far, it won't be long before you arrive at this figure simply because of asset prices going up. The second restriction, which is kind of obvious, the level of allowance available to you is directly linked to the value of your property. So if your main home is worth say 150,000 pounds, then this relief is capped at 150,000 pounds and not 175,000 pounds. There is a third restriction and it is quite important to understand this because I do come across many clients who, are, who have confusion around this or they have been wrongly advised previously or perhaps that was the right thing to do at that point. The third restriction is that the property which passes into a discretionary trust on the death of potential, uh, for the potential benefit of direct descendants, this will not qualify. Why? If you remember, I said the property or your main home has to, be, has to pass on to the direct descendants, which is your children or grandchildren. It cannot go via trust. Downsizing. At some point, we will be thinking of downsizing. So, if you have downsized or sold your property to move into care, then the residence nil rate man is still available. That's the good news. However, as long as it's only available, as long as the sold property would have qualified for the residence nil rate band had you retained it. And the replacement property, if you have sold and bought another one, and the cash generated from the sale uh, from, uh, from your home. Uh, is part of your estate and is passed down to your children, grandchildren or great-grandchildren, only then the downsizing relief is available. As you can see, this relief is quite complex with implications on your will, gifting money or assets, putting assets in a trust and all areas of inheritance tax planning. I really would suggest that you definitely take specialist advice on this topic or on this relief. But then the Tories said 1 million in the manifesto. So the purpose of this slide is to show you how the Tories in 2015 election campaign raised our hopes for the IHD nil rate band to go up to 1 million pounds. Technically, I guess they did honor, even though not to our expectations. Well, the 1 million pounds is pretty much based on a couple's nil rate band of 325,000 pounds times two, which gives you 650,000 pounds. And the couple's residential nil rate band, which is 175,000 pounds times two, giving us 350,000 pounds. This gives us a total nil rate band magic figure of 1 million pounds. It's clever, isn't it? So let me run through quickly two examples of how the inheritance tax is worked out. 
In this example, we have Brian, who is a widower, so he was married. He dies in May 2020, leaving his estate to his children, remember? Passing to his children, and he has a residential home. So what I meant to say, remember, when you pass down your home to your children, you could be eligible to for the residence nil rate band. So in total, his assets left would be two million pounds. He qualifies for the, for the couple's nil rate band, which is 650,000 pounds. And also he qualifies for the residence nil rate band for the couple, which is 350,000 pounds, leaving an, uh, an estate subject to inheritance tax of 1 million pounds. At 40%, the inheritance tax payable would be 400,000 pounds due by 30th of November, 2020. The second example, again, the same person, but just wanted to demonstrate when uh, someone passes away which, with almost double the estate value, then what, is, what, what do the figures look like? So in this situation, St. Brian dies uh, in May 20, he was a widower living his estate to his children. His home was worth two and a half million pounds and he had other assets of 1.5 million pounds, assuming they don't receive any relief. He doesn't, he's not eligible for the residence nil rate men. Why? Because his estate is worth way over, which is more than 2.7 million pounds. But he is eligible for the couple's nil rate band. So after deducting that band, the estate is worth 3.35 million pounds, subject to inheritance tax at 40%, and that would be 1.34 million pounds payable within six months. The importance of wills and lasting powers of attorney. Before you move on to any forms of estate planning or inheritance tax planning, it is essential that you have an up-to-date will. Even if, you, even if you have an up-to-date will, you might need to take action. For example, you might need to revisit your will to benefit from the residence nil rate band. As I said earlier, this new relief will only be, will only be available if the assets are left to your direct descendants children, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren. A lot of older wills hold assets in trust, and you could lose out if your will is not updated. We strongly recommend you take specialist advice to make sure your wishes are met and your wills are as tax efficient as possible. Many people set up mirror wills with their spouse, which means they leave their estate to the other in the event of the death. However, it might make more sense to make a will where, transfer, where you transfer some assets to your children or grandchildren after the death of the first spouse. It really depends on your circumstances. Likewise, having a property and a lasting power of attorney can help with inheritance tax planning. The attorneys do have limited powers to make gifts from the donor's asset, asset, estate. Further power can be obtained via consent from the court So let's talk about some planning to do with gifting. One of the key ways to reduce your inheritance tax bill is to give it away and let go. And what do I mean by let go? You have to lose control. And if this is an issue or concern to you, then, and you, and you don't want to lose control, then perhaps you may be ought to think about giving assets or, or placing assets in a trust. This is something Salish will cover in his part of the presentation. So there are a range of gift exemptions worth taking into account to help reduce the bill. These are simple steps and easy to do, but as you will see, very effective in the long term. Married couples and civil partners can transfer their assets and their tax-free allowances, if you like, to each other on the death of the first spouse. These transfers are completely free, but do watch out for transfers to non-domiciled spouses. There is a limit there of 325,000 pounds but it used to be much smaller, 55,000 pounds. I will cover the concept of domicile in the next few slides. Another way to reduce your IHT bill is to give regular gifts from surplus income. In surplus income could be anything. It could be your pension income. It could be your earnings, your investment income. It has to be regular and it has to be from surplus income. There are some requirements. It's, you should not compromise your lifestyle and spending habits. It is key to maintain records, and often this is missed out. And one of the other key, key criteria is you should be able to demonstrate that you are able to afford to make these gifts from regular 
from surplus income. Gifts made to registered charities in the UK. These are IHD free. These will not form part of your inheritance tax estate. And so also gifts to political parties, if, if you would like to do that. Salesh will cover charity givings in a, in, in a bit more detail in his presentation. Also, you should bear in mind that you can give away 3000 pounds per year, IHD free. If you don't give it away one year, you can carry it forward and no more, but use it then. Some of us might think it is too small, 3,000 pounds, but for a couple that makes 6,000 pounds, so it is quite useful. If you, if you would not like to do that and you're thinking of trust planning, you can settle more into your nil rate bed trust in addition to the 325. This 6,000 can be transferred additionally. Again, I will leave it to Salesh to cover that. You are able to make small gifts of up to 250 pounds to anyone you like. There is no limit to the number of recipients in a tax year. These small gifts will be free of IHT, provided you have made no other gifts to the same person during that year. If your son, grandchild, or anyone else is getting married, you are able to give them gifts without being subject to inheritance tax. There are limits though, 5,000 pounds, a gift from a parent, two and a half thousand pounds from a grandparent, and 1,000 pounds from anybody else. You do need to give this gift on or shortly before the marriage or the civil partnership, and the marriage has to go on. I just wanted to make one little point uh, before I move to the last uh, uh, big gift, if you like, that gifting and spending is often a cost-effective way and should at least be considered before you jump into any product-based solutions. Then there is the big one, pets. I'll cover this more in detail in the next slide. So I've covered the smaller gifts. I call it smaller because they're pretty much covered by the exemptions available. Let's talk about the larger ones. So there is this thing called PET, P-E-T. It stands for potentially exempt transfer. There are no limits on how much you can gift. So there is no 250 pounds, there is no the 3000 pounds, which I mentioned earlier on. Basically, this says you can give any amount, for example, could be cash, could be property, or any asset to anyone you like under the inheritance tax rules. And provided, believe it or not, seven years after making the gift, it escapes your inheritance tax bill. That's good, isn't it? Oops, sorry. Now, where did they get this seven years from is an interesting question. Actually, I don't think it's an interesting question at all. It's just a random rule of tax, and there are plenty of those about. How does this work? Supposing I was thinking right now, I'm not feeling brilliant doing this webinar, and I don't reckon I've got more than 10 years left in me. How am I going to reduce my death estate so I don't basically leave my family with some horrible inheritance tax to pay? So what am I going to do? Potentially, I'm not going to use the fact that I can give it to my wife and so on if it is somebody else. So I can start giving, start making gifts as soon as possible. It could be to my uh, family members, brothers, friends. So the idea is supposing I give some assets, some cash, shares, property. If I survive for at least seven years after making the gift, then the gift escapes my death estate and it is considered outside it. And the recipient does not have to worry about inheritance tax at any point as far as my death estate is concerned. But then what if I was to make a gift and then not survive for seven years? What then? If I was making the gift and say survive for four years, then there is potentially an inheritance tax liability on a sliding scale though. I have to survive the full seven years and then, believe it or not, as soon as I do that, the IHT liability falls to zero. So potentially exempt, what does it mean? So potentially exempt because obviously if I survive, until I survive for seven years, I don't know for sure whether I made the gift on the right time. And that is tax for you. If you think that's bizarre, then it is. Gifts made between three to seven years before death are taxed on a sliding scale. And this scale is known as taper relief. And I've got a little, there's this little table on the right hand corner of, your, of the slide. 
if you make a gift and you don't survive for three years, then the full gift is subject to inheritance tax 40%, obviously after the nail rate bend. But if you make a gift and you survive for more than three years, but not more than seven years, it depends uh, where in the table you fall. So for example, if you die uh, in four to five years after making the gift, then rather than paying 40%, uh, the estate will pay 24%. So there's a tapering on, uh, on for every year you die later within the seven years. But you've got to be cautious. Gifting is not all that rosy as we may think. With gifting, I will quickly run through a few points where we need to be cautious. So transferring asset to a spouse or parents gifting to say their newly married children to help them buy their first marriage home, for example, may later prove to be quite disastrous in an unfortunate divorce situation. A separating spouse will potentially end up taking an unfair share. So the problem here is it may fall in, in the wrong hands. A gift, second point, a gift has to be an outright gift and should not be enjoyed or benefited by the person making the gift. For example, gifting your main residence to your children whilst you still reside in the property will be regarded as a gift with reservation of benefit because you're still enjoying it. Until you pay a market rent to your children, unless you pay a market rent to your children on the property you gifted to them, the house will fall back into your estate for IHT purpose upon death. And paying rent, is that a wise thing to do? It's a cash flow issue. The children will end up paying income tax on the rent. Perhaps not a good idea as such. Capital gains tax. Before I talk to about capital gains, I think it's, it's worth mentioning uh, that a lot of us are thinking about passing properties. And one thing to watch out for is how you own that property. So properties can be owned jointly with somebody or as tenants in common. So worth getting it checked. Capital gains tax, third point, it's, this is an inevitable, this is inevitable in many cases to avoid the interaction between capital gains tax and inheritance tax. These are two separate taxes. Even though this webinar is all about inheritance tax, I would like to run through an example to show you the impact within, with capital gains tax. So the gift problem to do with capital gains tax. If I give the asset right away, it moves out of my inheritance tax estate. That is true, but watch out for the capital gains tax. This takes a bit of planning. Now imagine a father wants to gift a second property to the son, for example. Fine, not a problem. But if the father, if the father survived for seven years, after making the gift, it will fall outside in his inheritance tax. Maybe that's a good bit of planning and it works. But do watch out for the immediate capital gains tax obligation falling on the father for the, this will be the difference between the open market value of the property and the purchase price of the property. So what the property is worth now and how much the father paid. And that tax is payable through the tax return. More importantly, this brings a cash flow problem. This is because the father is gifting the property and not selling it. So he will have to find the cash to settle the, the CGT bill. Finally, please make sure that with all taxes and transactions of such nature, for example, gifting, you keep records. This is a very important point and often not done properly. <clears throat> I would, I would suggest that if you have accountants or advisors on, on board, share this information with them. They can hold this information for you. Remember, it is not you who is going to sort the estate out. It will be your executors who will be named on the will. So this will be helpful to them. Who is affected by IHT? Two lots, UK DOMS and non-UK DOMS. So UK domicile individuals who are residing in the UK or outside the UK, are potentially liable to inheritance tax on their worldwide assets. So whether the assets are in the UK or outside the UK, they are caught out. Non-UK domiciles, whether residing in the UK or outside the UK, are potentially liable to inheritance tax on only UK situated assets. So 
What is domicile after all? Inheritance tax is driven by domicile. In basic terms, your domicile is your permanent legal home. Domicile is not necessarily the same as nationality. It is also not the same as your residence. Residence is a term that drives income tax and capital gains tax. The difference between residence and domicile is that residence is relatively easy to change because it depends on where you are located. Whereas domicile isn't because it's your permanent legal home. So where you are born obviously influences that. Where your parents have spent most of their lives obviously influences that. So for example, if your parents are British and they happen to have you on a day trip to France, that doesn't make you a French domicile for the purpose of inheritance tax. Let me cover three types of common domicile which we come across. So domicile of origin, or sometimes we refer to as domi domicile of dependency. This is acquired at birth and is that of the child's father if the parents are married and that of the mother if the parents are not married. Domicile of choice. So you can actually change your domicile. So within the lifetime when an individual, an individual may actively choose to ch establish a domicile in an alternative country. However, it can be very difficult to lose a domicile of origin. Deemed domicile. These rules were introduced or rather changed in April 2017. So this applies to those who can demonstrate that they are non-UK domiciled, but, th but they have been resident in the UK for too long, which means at least 15 years out of the last 20 years. There is some sophisticated planning available to those who will be becoming UK deemed domiciled, approaching 15 years. This sort of planning cannot be left last minute. Example, someone who's been in the UK for 10 years might be approaching that 15 years and, and, and uh, chances are that they will remain in, the, in this country for a long time and has assets outside the UK. They could be thinking about doing something with those assets, perhaps thinking about settling those assets into a foreign non-UK discretionary trust. This is something, again, I'll leave it for Salesh to cover. That is the end of my presentation, and I thank you very much for listening. I will now hand over to Salesh to talk through the rest of the presentation. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, Samir, for giving a detailed explanation of inheritance tax and how to work out the liability after taking account of reliefs and exemptions. I, on my part, am going to concentrate on some of the planning solutions for people who will be affected by this tax. I've divided that into three areas, insurance-based planning, investment-based planning, and trust-based planning. We'll also talk about a bit about pensions and other forms of planning that is available. So let's start with insurance-based solutions. So here, what you are doing in simple terms is taking out life cover or life protection on the individuals that have an IHT liability on death, or which arises on death. You can also use this sort of planning for lifetime gifts. So the donor who has made the gift in his lifetime can also take out life cover for seven years so that in case they die within that time and a potential liability then crystallizes, the life cover will kick in to pay that liability. This is called the seven year intervivos policy. The thing to remember here is that you're not really getting rid of the IHD liability, but you are simply creating a fund for paying the liability. One of the key points to note here is that when you take out this life policy, that you must write it in trust. Because people who don't write policies in trust, 
when the policy crystallizes, it will fall back into their estate. So writing a policy in trust is crucial. When that is done, the policy proceeds don't form part of the individual's estate and it passes straight to the beneficiaries who can use the proceeds to pay the inheritance tax. Obviously, when you take out life cover, you have to note that the premiums that are payable for that cover will depend on your age. And if you have any health related problems, then obviously the premiums will increase. The next one is investment based solutions. These rely on a relief called business property relief. What the legislation says is that you can get relief at both 100% and 50%. So if you have a business or an interest in business, so either say you're a sole trader or running a business in partnership, that's what the business or an interest in business refers to. Or if you have unquoted shares in a qualifying trading company, and here the definition of unquoted shares is a bit wider and it includes shares listed on the alternative investment market. And in, on top of that, if you have loan notes in an unquoted trading company that you control, then the value of these investments will get relieved at the full 100%. So for inheritance tax purposes, the value will be zero. There's also relief given at 50% if you have shares and loan notes in a quoted company, which gives you control. Or if you have land, buildings, plant and machinery, which are used in your business, then you will get relief on those assets at 50%. the deceased or the transferor, if it's transferred during their lifetime, must have owned those assets for at least two years prior to death. This is one of the conditions for obtaining this relief. So people must check that if they're doing gifting during their lifetime, that they've owned those assets for at least two years. The investments must not be de the, the investment in the company or the business must not be dealing or investing in property or shares because that is not called a trading company for this purpose. People should also note that whilst on the one hand you, you can benefit from this relief, you are also taking a risk by investing in unquoted shares or in aim listed companies or if you're running a business those the business carries its own trading risks. Now let's move on to trust-based solutions. What is a trust? Well, in simple terms, it is a relationship where an asset, be it cash, shares or property, is held legally by one party called a trustee for the benefit of another party called the beneficiary. Trusts have been around for many hundreds of years and the wealthiest have used trusts both for protection and for inheritance tax planning. The key concept here is the separation of the legal and the beneficial ownership of the asset. There are various types of trusts such as discretionary trusts, interest in possession trust, trust for the vulnerable. So it's important that if you are contemplating doing this sort of planning that you take professional advice. You also have to bear in mind the costs that you will incur not only at the outset in creating trust and taking advice, but during the lifetime of the trust because it has its own obligations. So that is, that is very important to consider when you are looking overall at the, whether you should be doing this sort of planning. So how can trust be useful? Well, there are four areas I have put on this slide. First and foremost, let's talk about protection. 
So trust can be useful in protecting the asset that you are thinking of putting into a trust. Sometimes you may wish to give property to your children or grandchildren, but you, if you feel that, look, they are too young or won't be able to manage that asset, then trust can be very useful in these circumstances. It can also assist with wealth planning. So with trust, you can pass assets down the generations, not just the next generation, but the generation after that and the one after that in a very tax efficient way while still retaining control of the asset. Obviously, trusts are very useful in saving tax. Here, although in, each, in the initial instance, you may accelerate some of the taxes, in the long term, it could be very beneficial from the overall tax that you pay by planning through trusts. And finally, you can preserve confidentiality. Although recently there have been some changes, there is still confidentiality that can be given when assets are put into trust. The reason being that the legal owner is separate from the beneficial owner. Let's look at a diagram just to explain how this all fits in. And I'll also give you an example here. So say there's a grandfather who's got plenty of assets and he feels that he wishes to give some of these assets away by way of a trust. So in this scenario, the grandfather is called the settlor. He is the one who is settling the property into trust. The, the asset then goes into a trust where the asset is held for the benefit of the beneficiaries. In his case, he may want to benefit his grandchildren. So the grandchildren are the beneficiaries of the trust. Obviously the trust needs to be managed. And here the person who manages, person or persons who manage this trust are called trustees. In this case, it could be the grandfather and his son who could be trustees. They could have many more trustees than that. The grandfather may have particular wishes that he wants to tell the trustees as to how these assets should be managed, where they should be passed to. So this can be documented in a letter of wishes. Although this letter of wishes is not binding on the trustees, it acts as a good reminder to the trustees as to the settlor's wishes. Let's look at the key points regarding trusts. The first point to note here is that the gifting rules that Samir talked about apply. So if you were to gift an asset into a trust, and if you survive seven years, then there won't be any inheritance tax liability on yourself. However, if you passed away within those seven years, then the rules Samir described will kick into place. So based on that first point that I just made, the important thing is that if you gift an asset into a trust, and if it's, say for example, that you had a property worth 300,000 pounds, you put it into a trust and you survive seven years, then at the end of the seven years, you have again your nil rate band, which you can use again and you can do a similar exercise every seven years. So if you start early enough and if you've got a lot of surplus wealth, then you can go through two or three or four cycles and put assets into trust. So thereby reducing your estate. One other important point why people use trust to transfer assets across is that it defers your capital gains tax. Samir again talked about, give an example of a property which was pregnant with a lot of gains. Now, if the individual was to gift that directly to his son or his grandchildren, he has to also think about capital gains tax, which will be payable immediately. However, if you 
if you were to put the asset into a trust, then you have the option of deferring those capital gains tax, which is very important for a lot of people because the important point Samir made is that when you're gifting that asset, you're not actually receiving any monies in return. So if you had to pay the capital gains tax, that would come out also from your, from your uh, assets. Let's look at trust taxation. So firstly, in terms of inheritance tax, as I said, that when you put the asset into the trust, there is what is called an entry fee. Now, if the value of the asset going in is within the nil rate band of 325,000, then that entry fee will be nil. But if it's above that, then there will be inheritance tax to pay at 20% on anything above the nil rate band of 325,000. Thereafter, every 10 years, there is something called a 10 yearly charge. The maximum charge is 6% of the value of the property less the nil rate band. So this happens every 10 years. So again, if you put in, if you put assets into a trust and it's left in the trust for a long time, then you'll have these charges every 10 years. Then when assets come out of the trust, there is something called an exit charge. And again, that can be worked out. It's, it's based on the 6% rule, but you know, it's a complicated calculation, but there is a charge. That's the important thing to note. But as I said earlier, even though there are these charges, in the long run, it may be worthwhile putting assets into the trust because you may make an inheritance tax saving. The trust is also liable to income tax and capital gains tax. So the income that the asset earns within the trust will be liable to income tax. And primarily that is taxed at 45%. A very, it's the additional rate of tax that individuals who have income over 150,000 have to pay. But in this case, the trust's income has to pay on virtually all of that income. However, with good planning, that tax can actually be reclaimed. The trust also has capital gains tax liabilities if it sells an asset at a gain. Again, the rate of tax will be either 20% for non-residential assets and 28% for residential assets. And as I explained, there's regular inheritance tax to pay every 10 years and on the exit. As I explained, the upfront inheritance tax is only payable on assets who, which are put into trust where the value is above the 325,000 nil rate band. In terms of planning, trust can be a very useful tool for school fee planning. Let's now move on to pensions. Pensions are very tax efficient. Let me just recap a bit in terms of the rules regarding pensions. So contributions into a pension plan receive tax relief at your highest income tax rate. Once the funds are in the pension plan, they grow tax-free. So there's no income tax or capital gains tax that the pension plan has to pay. So it grows very efficiently. If you exercise the pension plan, the first 25% of the fund up to a maximum of 268,275 pounds is tax-free. The balance, if you were to draw it out of your pension plan, will be taxed as income at your highest rates. From an inheritance tax point of view, no inheritance tax is due on the funds in a pension plan. If an individual were to die before 75 years of age, then there won't be any tax due on the pension pot that goes out to the beneficiary of that part. However, if death were to happen after 75 years of age, 
then the whole pot will be taxable on the beneficiary. But he can sometimes control that by how much he takes out of the pension plan. Pension planning is very popular and tax efficient. And if, you, if funds were to be passed over to the children or grandchildren, and the individual was to die before age 75, then it comes out free of any tax. However, you have to note that you have to notify the trustees of your pension plan as to who should benefit from the funds inside the pension plan were you to die before exercising it. Another form of planning is creating a debt. So here, what you're doing is borrowing against an asset. So let me give you an example. You have, say, a grandparent with a property portfolio. Say, let's take one property, for example, which is worth a million pounds. Now, the grandparent could say, okay, look, I want to borrow against this property of half of a million pounds, and I'll borrow about half a million. So between the two grandparents, once the half a million pound is borrowed, they can each gift 250,000 each to their grandchildren. So here, when they gift this money, the gifting rules will apply. So if they were to survive seven years from the date of this gift, this gift of 250,000 each would fall away outside of their estate. But what, then what is left in the estate is the property of a million pounds, less the loan of half a million pounds that they took out. So suddenly they have reduced their estate by half a million pounds and inheritance tax will only be due on the net value of that property, net of the loan. So this is a good way of doing something whilst someone is alive. And it's a good use of putting assets into beneficiaries' hands. Now let's talk about charity giving. So here, any gifts that are made to charities are free of inheritance tax. And I know within our community, we do make a lot of charity gifts. So one thing to consider is that if you gift 10% 10 of your estate to a charity, then the inheritance tax rate that you will pay on the remaining part of your estate will not be at 40%, but it'll be reduced by 10% to 36%. So this is something that people should consider. On top of that, obviously, as I said earlier, that any gifts that you make during your lifetime to charity, they are free of inheritance tax. And also you receive relief in terms of income tax. So it's certainly worth considering. Some people say, I don't really want to do anything. I don't want to do any inheritance tax planning. Let me quote you Roy Jenkins, a very well-known MP who said back in 86 that inheritance tax is broadly speaking, a voluntary levy paid by those who distrust their heirs more than they dislike their inland revenue. Some people say that, look, it's not my problem my beneficiaries will still be better off when I die. Even after paying the IST, they will receive the remaining assets. Very true. But if, with a bit of thought, if you can do a bit of planning, and whilst at the same time, you have the security and the safety of having assets with you till death, which will look after both yourself and your spouse, then why not carry out planning? Some people say that, look, live your life and don't worry what happens after death. This is true as well. 
um, you know, people say that, look, you shouldn't keep on hoarding all your wealth, but you should spend it and live your life to the full. And then there still will be plenty of assets left for your beneficiaries following your death, even after paying any inheritance tax. Again, a valid point. So just summarizing now, the final messages are, firstly, if you want to carry out inheritance tax planning, you must be willing to let go of some of your assets. Again, if you want to carry out planning, then it's best to start planning early because as we said, there is always a seven year clock running on any gifts that you make, whether it's directly or whether it's through a trust. So if you start early enough, then you can get a few cycles of these seven year clocks. As you would probably have gained from this uh, webinar, you know, inheritance tax is not an easy tax to understand. And the terminology used in things like trusts or, you know, trustees or beneficiaries or settlers is very confusing to the lay people. So it's always important to seek professional advice when dealing with inheritance tax plan. It is important to remember that you may need your assets for a rainy day. So first and foremost, before even contemplating inheritance tax planning, make sure that you and your spouse are secure. So don't gift away assets which you may need at a later date, whether that is for healthcare purposes, or you may have to go into a nursing home, or you may need carers. So you will need these assets. As you've seen, it is a complicated and messy affair, especially if simple measures such as good record keeping or a will are not in place. And this was covered in one of our earlier webinars. And finally, don't also forget to spend your wealth and enjoy your life. Thank you very much for listening to this webinar. I will now pass you over to Rumit, who will coordinate the question and answer. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, Samir and Sailesh.